you, Khaki Tours, for inviting me. In the words of a great Indian sage, he said, how will you know where to go when you do not know where you come from? Born and brought up in Thane, these lines became my quest. Several decades of dedicated research at my own pace led me to a treasure trove of revelation, an ocean of discovery that has promoted in me a great sense of pride and belonging, firstly, to this motherland, India, and of course, to my city, Thane, whose evolution from early times is a consummate part of our nation's trajectory. I humbly attempt to share today just a mere cup from that ocean and hope that it invokes in the listener the same joy and pride and awe and a sense of belonging while being participants of life in this magnificent and glorious civilization. I am not an authority. I am a passionate searcher. And my research as a doctoral student was a product of my passage through this life to search for the whys. And history taught me a lot. So I'm going to give you in this talk an overview of how a city came to being. But before we come to the city, which will actually be in the next talk, I'm going to take you from the outer core and then bring you to the atomic center in the next talk. For a perspective, did you know that the population of Mumbai Island in 1600 CE was 3,000 Kolis? and one Portuguese landlord, Garcia de Horta, who stayed where governor's house is. Mumbai, as we know it, evolved only after 1630 CE. Now listen to this poem and the words very carefully. It encapsulates briefly the diverse footprint. Every line tells you the story. O Thane, my beloved Tana, a few thousand years uncovered tales of horses, silk, incense, and stone. Your people changed, a port withdrew. A Marco Polo visit described you too. The Parsi flame, a Judaic star, no other city was on par. The Hindu kings resigned to fate, Muslim rulers, stormed your gates, Portuguese fidalgos, musket fire, Christian churches, temples ire, Maratha armies besieged your fort, British cannon destroyed your moat, yet you thrive, a living pulse toward the future galactic Sri Sthanak. That poem encapsulate in brief the story that you will hear in part two. Now I proceed to read out various names that Thana was known as through the ages. Heptanesia. This is 200 BC. Chersonesus, Ptolemy's map, 150 AD. Sristhanaka, Puri, from slabs and copper plate inscriptions 107 AD, 1078 AD. Tana, T-A-N-N-A, Yules Marco Polo, 1290 AD. Tana, called by Ibn Battuta, traveler, description 1334 AD. Tana Mayambu, traveler Duat Barboza, 1510 AD. O Kakabe Datane, Portuguese era, 1535 AD. Thana, during the Maratha times, and Thane, now. Different names.
I now proceed to share very early history for you to comprehend evolutionary sources of the region. According to the Thana Gazette here by James Campbell, originally printed in 1882, the earliest known history of Thane coast belongs to the third century before Christ. It is the engraving of Ashoka's edicts on basalt boulder, boulders at Sopara, about six miles north of Basin. According to Buddhist writings, Sopara was a royal seat and a great center for commerce during the lifetime of Gautama Buddha. Incidentally, I was researching Sanchi and got to study that uh, Ashoka built 84,000 stupas all over the country. This must have been one of them. Sopara is popular, consi popularly considered it as Ophir, a great trade center visited by King Solomon's ships a thousand years before Christ. This identification leads back to an earlier trade between Egypt and the Holy Land of Panth, BC 2500 to 1600. And this in turn leads to the prehistoric traffic from Thana coast to Persia, Arabia, and Africa. It is known that by the help of regular winds, Hindus and Arabs have from prehistoric times traded from West India to Arabia, Africa, and Persia. This belief is supported by the mention in Genesis, BC 1700, Cap 28, chapter, of Arabs trafficking in Indian spices, by the early use of Indian articles among the Egyptians, that's quoted in Wilkinson, Ancient Egyptians, popular edition. Under Ashoka, the west coast of India was enriched by the opening of direct sea trade with Egypt. The next dynasty known to connect with the Thana coast are the Shatakarnis and the Shatavahanas, whose inscription in the Nana Pass makes it probable that they held the Konkan around BC 100. The trade connection between Thana coast and the Parthian rulers in the Persian Gulf has a special interest during the period 255 BC to 235 AD. In the latter part of the first century, after the Shatakanas were driven from the Konkan and the North Deccan by foreigners, apparently Scythians or Parthians from North India, the merchants of Thana ports were Hindus, Buddhists, favoring trade and owing many of its finest monuments to the liberality of Konkan merchants. The Karli and Kanheri cathedral caves were made by merchants, and there are many inscriptions in the Kanheri caves which record minor gifts by merchants. The shipping of the Thana coast included small coasting craft, medium-sized vessels that went to Persia and large Indian, Arab, and Greek ships that traded to Yemen and Egypt. In the years immediately after the conquest of Persia, the Arabs made several raids on the coasts of Western India. One of these in 637 AD from Bahrain and Oman plundered the Konkan coast near Thane. After this painting, it would not be complete without a short note on the Thana Creek, on whose waters most of these stories took birth. For without that, we would be confined only to tribal history. Permit me to share my story on the Thana Creek. The ancient history of Aparanta, Sopara, Kalyan, and our city of Thane has evolved around the waters of the Thana Creek as waterborne and seaborne trade was predominant in the region over several thousand years. The creek is an inlet on the shoreline of the Arabian Sea and runs between Ghodbandar and Thane, where the Ullas River flows from the north of the island to meet the Arabian Sea on the west. The other part 
flows between the city of Thane and the Arabian Sea at Trombe before the Gharapuri Islands. The creek has panoramic views and is enriched with rich green mangroves, sparkling exquisite biodiversity of birds, fish, and floral species. It is the largest creek in Asia, running a length of 26 kilometers. The mangrove forests provide nurseries for several fish species. It also acts as a buffer against floods, cyclones, and seawater intrusions, enhancing the resilience of the surrounding areas. It is also a sanctuary for flamingos and several important bird species. It is on these waters that our various traders, foreign invaders, foreign travelers sailed, alighting at various points along the creek from the times of King Solomon, 1000 BC. The stretch between Thani and Ghodbandar evolved into a palatial paradise, 15th, 16th century, for the rich nobility of Portugal. The creek shores were dotted with mansions, churches, forts, pleasure gardens, breakfast parlors, including African slaves serving European masters. The British indulged in recreational pleasure cruises from Mumbai. They have left glowing reports of the rich and naturally endowed surroundings they feasted upon. In these times, the creek has lost its maritime importance, so that trade has shifted to deep sea ports. Thane still exists with some commercial activity of fishing, pleasure cruising, dredging. Along its banks, one notices modern developed spots affording food and beverage facilities for the traveler who would also enjoy musing on the creek's panorama. Shipping for thousands of years was a very light tonnage. And so the ships had to berth in shallow waters. Ships had to berth in shallow waters, sorry. They were built of light tonnage and therefore shallow waters, up to 200 tons. So up to about 1560, 1600, the creek was very powerful in terms of trade with Sopara, Kalyan, Thane, all having their own time as premium ports. As soon as the tonnage increased and the British took over the island of Bombay, after 1630, they invited the Parsis, the Banias, the Gujaratis to populate Bombay. And they envisaged a port, deep harbor ports. And that's how the trading in the creeks stopped and deep harbor ports with heavy ships started berthing on the ocean front. So that's the story of the Thana Creek. The good news about the creek is that current administration in its city development plan and its vision document has listed creek conservation programs as a priority. A comprehensive survey for revival of the creek has already been undertaken. Other than <clears throat> the creek, uh, uh, treating creek pollution control, mangrove conservation, coastal beautification, the administration is also looking to open the creek waters under public private state partnership to generating inland navigation with speed boating, ferry cruises with cultural programs, and perhaps even casinos. So we can look forward to the future of the creek in full flow.
it is now my pleasure to give you a further understanding of the importance of now thane to read out short reports on thane and the surrounding regions from important international travelers spanning first century to the 17th centuries this would give you an absolute overview and help you to revel in picturizing those times i'll start with the ptolemy was a greco egyptian astronomer mathematician and geographer who flourished in alexandria during the 2nd century his most important geographical innovation was to record longitudes and latitudes and degrees for nearly 8000 locations on his world map he has many early mentions of the region sol set thane and sopara binda was a name given for basin creek simula or timula referred to chaul hep heptora was the name given to ghodbandar supara was placed between navriyari and shaul this early mention of various towns of the region shows how important this area was for overseas trade with western india ports of over 2000 years and how it gradually evolved into creek ports including sopara kalyan and thane cosmos indico pliostos 535 ad was a greek merchant and a hermit from alexandria of egypt he was a 6th century traveler who made many voyages to india during the reign of emperor justinian he is famous for his work on christian topo topography he mentions kalyana so close to thane as one of the chief marts of western india the seat of a powerful king with a great trade in brass blackwood logs and articles of clothing it was also the seat of a christian bishop who received ordinance from the persians about 100 years later next huan sang 640 ad 7th century buddhist monk from china who traveled to india in 629 to 645 he speaks highly of brahman colleges and places of learning being famous and held in high honor as the brahmans slowly phased out the buddhists in canary caves on solset island the earliest reference to thana town is that of 636 ad it was rich enough to tempt usman bin asi sakifi governor of bahrain and oman to send a plundering expedition from the persian gulf at this time the contact between india and the arab world which was confined to coastal areas was limited to the sphere of commerce on the indian coast the centers of arab merchants were at daibul thana khambaya chimur sandaren kolan mali early arab contact with south asia states that were large number of muslim colonies had were at thane khambayar garvi gandhar begram goya kandapur and hanur 850 ad ships of buzur p shariar nakuda sailed along the west coast he met in thane a certain mohammed b musul a seafaring merchant of straf who had lived in thana for more than two decades and who had visited many towns of india this was in 849 nakudi another arab historian 915 ce mentions subara along with thane and saimur which is chaul as coast towns where the lar dialect was spoken in the beginning of the 10th century makudi mentions the names of tana t a n a h and tabhe as one of the chief coastal towns about a century later al biruni a khazaran iranian scholar in 1017 traveled to india 
and speaks of Tana as the capital of the Konkan about 40 miles south of Subara. The Geniza records in 1000 CE are documents written a thousand years ago, buried and discovered in a Cairo synagogue, Ben Ezra synagogue, containing 3,30,000 pieces of paper, papers containing scriptural knowledge and secular letters of everyday life, discovered by Solomon Shexter, late 19th century, mentions about trade in India and Thane especially. It mentions of an international merchants organization known as Karim, of which Thana was one of the premium flourishing trade centers. Now one of the greatest travelers in the world of his time, from the court of Genghis Khan, visited Thane on a rainy night in 1290 AD. What was he doing in Thane? Marco Polo. He visited Thane in 1290 AD. I will go on to read a description of his after I finish these other travelers. In 1321, Friar Jordanus. wrote the famous Mirabila Descripta, furnishing the best account of Indian regions, products, climate, manners, customs, fauna and flora, given by a European in the Middle Ages. In this work is detailed the martyrdom of four friars in Thane, that are known as the martyrs of Thane. A detailed report is included in my book that is going to be published in about a month and a half. The next traveler that came, Abul Fida, 1273 to 1331, Kurdish historian and geographer, speaks of Thana as the best city of the province of Allar, celebrated for producing Tanasi. Tanasi was a handmade silk cloth that Thana was famous for. They made it for about six to 700 years. It was so famous that St. Francis Xavier used to write to his Jesuits in Thane, where they had a church in Pokhran, <clears throat> asking the brothers or the fathers if they ever visited Goa to please bring bales of Tanasi, the handmade silk, for his vestments and his altars and the very popular thing, the handmade silk of Thane. I have detailed stories in my book and the next talk in part two will give you absolute details of that. So silk manufacturing Thane for about 800 years. That was a report by Abul Fida. The next traveler, Al Adrisi in 1300 CE calls Thana Bana, a pretty town upon a great gulf where vessels anchor and from where they say. A pretty town upon a great gulf where vessels anchor and from where they say. Gildermeister, a German orientalist, 19th century, thinks that Thana is the only port known to the Arabs between Broch and Goa when it is considered that not too long ago, the sea must have filled up the whole space between the hills on the east of Thana Creek and those on the west of it, and flowed over a very wide expanse of country between Thana and Basin. Friar Oderic, another traveler to Thana, 1331. 1296 to 1331, was an Italian, late medieval Franciscan friar and a missionary explorer. He came to Thane and the surrounding region in 1321 from Ormuz. 
at this city of Thana, Thomas of Tolentino and his three Franciscan companions had recently been martyred. Oderic managed to retrieve the remains of the martyrs from Supara and Yathane and carried them on his further travels. A detailed article on this will be in my book. Fifteen thirty-eight, Portuguese viceroy João de Castro and physician Garcia de Orta, whom I spoke about earlier in fifteen forty-two, speak very briefly of the invasions of the Deccan by sultans of Delhi. Speaking then of early history of Thana, Castro says, "In times past, Thane held sway over extensive tracts of land." and a large part of Gujarat was subjected to it and lived under its laws. John Fryer, the next traveler, an English doctor and travel writer, 1650, 1733, mentions in his time, there were seven churches and colleges in the account of Thana district. Hana is mentioned as having a cathedral church. After this comes the Italian traveler, Gamali Carreri in 1695, makes mention of a lot of things, including Bandra Fort. Let me read that out for you. Gameli Kareri in Churchill's Voyages talks of a great plague that decimated the population of Basin in 1690. The Bombay garrison was reduced to 35 soldiers. It was so violent that if you gave, it gave nobody a chance to prepare for a good end. But in a few hours in Surat, Daman and Thane, it carried off whole cities of people. He also mentions the church Nosa Senora Davida, one of the oldest churches in Basin, was adorned with three gold altars. Gameli Kareri in 1695 gives a grand detailed description of the Kanheri caves situated on the island of Salsa. Gameli Kareri in 1695 describes an underground church, once a rock cut temple, on which had been built a Franciscan college and a monastery in Monzape, Monopaze. Gameli Kareri in 1695 describes Thana as an open, excellent country protected by five small forts, garrisoned and furnished with cannon. Its calicos were of most superior quality. No place in the Portuguese dominions ex exceeded it. These are some reports of foreign travelers that lend credence to the pride and awe that was instilled in me as a just a little boy in Thane and wondering what it was all about. I would be playing on the football fields and the Maidans, hockey and football. They were bordered by a fort, a major fort, beautiful churches, lovely temples, old Maratha uh, uh, houses, and Ashoka pillar in the middle of nowhere. And as a kid, I wondered, what kind of a town was this? There was the Golden Mile that had a Jewish synagogue, a Parsi Agyari, Kopaneshwar Temple, St. John's Church, all in one little area, a city of multi-faiths, existing with multi-faiths from the first century AD. These details I will tell you of migration of people from the West Coast, from Israel, the early Jews, the early Christians known as Nestorians how they came onto this coast in 70 AD when Jerusalem burned. 
but that's for another day. Time permits perhaps one more description, Thana Port. Ancient Aparanta or Konkan coastal region of Western Maharashtra has played a unique role in promotion of maritime and cultural relations with Greece, Rome, East African coast, the Red Sea, and the Persian and Arabian Gulfs. A narrow strip of land extending approximately 600 kilometers north-south and having an average width of 60 to 80 kilometers is interspersed with several small rivers and creeks. This helped to develop ports and harbors over the Konkan coastline. These consist in the districts of Thana, Raigad, Ratnagiri, and Sindhudurga. The antiquity of the region early goes back to 5th century BC. Sri Sthanaka was one of the ports mentioned in Dr. B.C. Law's list of prominent ports of Western India. The earliest influence reference of this information about Konkan ports comes from the accounts of Strabo, PC 54, Pliny the Elder, AD 77, Ptolemy, AD 135, Periplus, AD 247. The authors enlighten us about trade and commerce between the Konkan ports and the West, Egypt, Persia, Gulf, the Red Sea, etc. Thana, known as Heptanesia, was recognized as a major port of mention by the above writer geographer, among others. Among other ports like Sopara, Kaliana, Semula, which is Chaul, and Palapatam, Pale, near Mahar. In various places over time, the Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Abyssinians, and Iranians frequented our Konkan ports with active involvement in trade between 5th century BC and 7th century AD. Later, permanent settlement of Jews, early Christians, Parsis, Arabs, and Abyssinians were seen on the Konkan coastline. These communities adopted the region as their new homeland and preserved their distinct social, cultural, and religious identities. Ptolemy divided Konkan into three regions, Arahayake, corresponding to Salset, Mumbai Islands and a part of the Deccan, Sandam's Ariake of North Konkan and Pirates' Ariake of South Konkan. The earliest reference of Indian ports in the Bible, whose king Hiram of Tyre brought gold, silver, ivory, monkeys, peacocks, and sandalwood for King Solomon also from the land of Ophir. This is Nala Sopara, which according to 60% of the world's historians is Sopara. Ophir. Now, if these ships came to Ophir in 1000 BC, they cruised down the Thana Creek and passed those regions. Imagine how old that is. Those were the earliest references. Baladuri, an Arab geographer mentioned a naval expedition against Thane in 636 under the leadership of Usman bin Aziz Sakafi. I've told you this before. 7th century AD onwards, the most lucrative trade from Thana ports included import of fine breed of horses that came from Aden, Sheher, Dhafar, Kalad, Kish, and Ormuz. The merchants that carried on the Thane trade were Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, and Gujaratis. The ships that carried on the trade were Konkan, Gujarati, and Malabar vessels, sometimes boats built in the Persian Gulf, or perhaps an occasional junk from Java or China also visited Thana port. So these are notes on uh, very early Thane. I would like to read out uh, bullet points on 
timeline specific to Thana city now to give you an idea of the stuff that has gone on. Each timeline has its own story and therefore one would need hours to talk about these kind of things that would be featured in the second part of my talk. So on a summary basis, I'll read out some bullet points of events. Beginning of course with 636 AD, Thana was plundered by an ex uh, expedition from the Persian Gulf. 956 AD, mentioned by Makudi as one of the chief towns of Western coast of India. 997 AD, copper plates mentioned Thane under the name of the Silahara kings who ruled over the Konkan and the present Kolaba district. The North Konkan family ruled from Thane from 800 to 1250 AD. So Thana has come full circle where Eknath Shinde from Thane is ruling over Maharashtra now. So that's like a 2000 year revolve. 1026-1094 AD mentions the town and port of Sri Sthanaka on copper plates. 1290 AD, Marco Polo describes Thana as a great and wealthy city after his visit. 1318 AD, Mubarak Khilji conquered Thane and placed it under a Muslim governor. 1429 AD, Thana was taken by a Bahamani general. 1480, it became the chief town of one of the five provinces into which Gujarat was divided. 1514 AD, it became a fortress of the king of Gujarat. 1529, the ruler of Thane was forced to pay tribute to the Portuguese. 1530 to 33 AD, Thana was plundered by the Portuguese twice and once by the Gujaratis. 1533 AD, it became part of the Portuguese territory by a treaty in December, 1533. 1737, Marathas liberated Thane from the Portuguese. 1739, Thana came under the, Mara, uh, under the Marathas by the Treaty of Basin. 1774, the British overhauled Thane and conquered the Marathas and they were there till independence. These are some of the important timelines and stuff that occurred. Now, these were a few chapters of my book. My book has 30 chapters devoted to all time periods from 1 AD till the Silaharas. After the Silaharas, it's a chapter by itself. After the Silaharas, the Islamic period. After the Islamic period, from 1230 to 1530, I have a chapter, major chapter on the Portuguese, 1530 to 1737. Then I have a major chapter on the Marathas, 1737 to 1774. Then there is a, another major chapter on the British, 1774. Now each ruler left his mark on Thane, of which I'd like uh, you to run that PPT with some of those photographs that perhaps could make sense here, uh, where I can just explain this belongs to so-and-so period. And there are stories within stories. So there are a thousand pages to talk about the Silahara, that's 400 years. <laughs> There are a thousand pages on the Portuguese. There are a thousand pages on the British. You know, I mean, it's history is an oceanic subject. And uh, I'm just bringing a little cup 
from that ocean of discovery. So if you like, yes. So this is the Thana Creek we talked about. Look at the vast expanse. This is somewhere near Godbandar now. I've already given you a description of the creek and ha. Huh. The Thana, of course, in uh, current history books is a city of lakes. Of course, the lakes have been there forever, especially Masunda around which it's uh, it's it's when the when the when the lake is emptied, secrets of a thousand years appear. City of Lakes. This is a fabulous uh, temple construction by the Silahara dynasty. They were great temple builders. Most of them Shiva sites. Bhumija style. Some of these are statues found in the lakes in Thane. When the lakes dried up, temple statues were found, taken out and preserved in various sites, but all from the Silahara times. Marco Polo's visit. Perhaps, perhaps I could give you a little shot of Marco Polo's visit. It's a very popular thing in the Thana timeline. I could afford the time to read out his report. Uh -huh. Marco Polo, son of Niccolo Polo, was born in Venice in 1254. He started traveling the seas at a very early age. In 1275, Marco Polo arrived in Chandu in the presence of the great Kublai Khan. Marco Polo, accompanied by his brother, spent 17 long years in China, where he's a, he was employed in various capacities and was sent on distant missions. On one of these missions, the great traveler visited the Western littoral of India and reported in detail on places like Ceylon, Makabar, Multifi, Lar, Karl, Kalyan, Komari, Gujarat, and finally Tana, our very own Tana. Yes, he landed in Thane in 1290 on a rainy night, as it is described, in April, and offered a detailed description of the town, which I have the absolute pleasure of reproducing for the reader or the listener verbatim. So nothing is lost or misrepresented from the original. Here it goes. Here is told of the kingdom of Tana, T-A-N-A. -A. Tana is a great kingdom lying towards the Northeast. It is a vast and excellent kingdom. They have a king of their own and they pay tribute to no one. They are idolaters and have a language of their own. Pepper and other spices do not grow so abundantly here as in other countries of which we have been talking to you. There is plenty of frankincense, black leather, and wood. It is not like, however, white, but brown. There is much trade and great numbers of ships and merchants flock hither and thither, for they get their excellent and beautiful hides, black leather, dressed in different ways. They also get plenty of good buckram and cotton. The merchants who go there on their ships bring many wares, mainly gold, silver, copper, and many other kinds of merchandise needed in the kingdom. And they take away with them these products of the country out of which they think they will get profit and gain. Another thing I will add, which is not so good. I tell you then that many pirates sally forth 
from this kingdom and cruise about the sea, doing much harm to traders. And I assure you that it is by the will of their king. So we had corruption at that time as well with the authorities. For he has made a covenant with the pirates who have to give him all the horses they capture. And you must know that they capture them after often enough. For as I have told you before, there is a great trade in horses all over India as the merchants take great numbers of them to sell so that few ships go to India without carrying some. For this reason, then the king has covenanted with the pirates that they are to give him all the horses they capture, all other goods, including gold, silver, and precious stone, fall to the pirate's share. Now this is an evil practice, not worthy of a king. Now we have told you of the kingdom of Tana. We will also add that they had silk-robed merchants walking the street in beautiful bungalows with oyster shell window dressings. Imagine the wealth of that port in 1290 AD when one of the greatest travelers in the world of that time makes such a vivid description. Professor C.F. Bendito prepared an Italian edition of Marco Polo from various travelers' narratives. This piece is taken from the English translation by Aldo Ricci. The original writings termed Codex II are in the Ambrosian Library in Milan. Marco Polo's original travel quotes formed the basis of his own narrative, which he dictated to a man of letters from Pisa called Rusticello. The name has found its very down to us in modern times through various translations in Italian and English. Tana in 1290 AD from Marco Polo's notes was under the rule of Hindu kings and obvious from the description, it was a bustling fort island with a fair amount of trade in frankincense, hides, buckrams, and cottons, which the town and region produced. In turn, they imported horses, gold, silver, copper, and other merchandise. There must have been a thriving merchant population with wealthy abodes. The town being an important port for import and export has had great connectivity into the hinterland of the subcontinent as goods and services were supplied from this point all over the region. Perhaps one can surmise that this was definitely a golden period in Thana's history. Naturally connected to Marco Polo's visit and his observations with specific reference to the import of horses and the horse trade is the region called Ghodbandar, eight kilometers from Thane city. A whole separate study is devoted in my book to Ghodbandar which corroborates and verifies the truth, the observances of the great Marco Polo and Thane's glorious past. With this, I'd like to perhaps, uh, you can run those slides, but that's part of the Islamic times that you're seeing on your screen. You can change to the next. The Portuguese had a grand time in Thane, built a lot of churches. All the churches are built and the beautiful altars are from the wood of the Basin Hills in which they traded. Most of their nobility stopped. Military activity and became businessmen selling wood and building mansions on the Ghodwanda Strip. These are cannon from the Tana port and fort now on display near the old port. This is a bit of a door from the old Tane church, which shows Antonio di Porto, who built St. 
Anthony's Friary, which is now St. John's Church, actually. This is the old painting of Thana Fort from the bungalow of Stephen Babington, a British officer. Those stories are all in my book, long and beautiful stories of adventure, invasions, sacrifice. The Maratha Empire, yes. They liberated Thane from the Portuguese in 1737. This is Kopaneshwar temple, which already existed before, but as with one power that conquers and destroys, the temple was rebuilt when the Marathas liberated Thane. It has one of the biggest lingams in Maharashtra, a premium site of worship for the locals on the Masunda Lake. That's the good old Masunda Lake, a thousand years old with so many stories to tell. My next talk would have a lot of elaboration on all this that you see in detail. Yeah, the British invaded Thane through some treachery and stayed there till 1947. This is St. James Church, which was built for the British soldiers in Thane. There were 100 soldiers. This is a garrison church that was built in 1825 by Bishop Herber. Beautiful with Corinthian pillars and a lovely design. Of course, the British gave Thane the first railway in India, I, I would think in Asia. Bombay to Thana, 1858. That's Thana Station, early Thana Station. That's thank you. But uh, I must thank you for your patience, your listening. I hope this has uh, helped you with uh, broadening your vision of that wonderful city, which, by the way, was called a dormitory town during the British times. Everybody said that, oh, when I used to go to St. Xavier's College and, they, and, and I, they would ask me, where are you from? I'd say Thane. They would say, oh, the mental asylum is there. That's all they remember. Somebody would say it's a dormitory town for the British where people go to sleep, take a train next morning and come to Bombay to work. But man, this city, obliterates the glory of Mumbai. Let me tell you that. You can see from the antiquity of the length of its history and the reports cursorily that I've only touched the top of the atomic circle. I've not gone to the core yet. You can imagine how old and how magnificent this culture is. I mean, this is a, an example of our nation. It's a small example of what we are today, India. All the communities are there. This is a miracle town. You don't have... The Jews came there in 70 AD. The Christians came there in 70 AD. Jerusalem burnt. The earliest Christians and Jews came 70 AD. The Parsis came around 800 AD. The Arabs were there before... Muhammad, the prophet, came as traders. They were already on the Thana coast. Persians, Abyssinians, Greeks. So, the ocean of history and the footprint of man cannot be comprehended in one lifetime. It's like the internal travel of a spiritualist. You cannot reach salvation in one lifetime, but you at least walk in that direction and do a dedicated study both internally and externally. My study of Thane is part of my spiritual search for myself, which deals with the history of mankind around me. And I've also been into the history of the Vedas and Indian philosophy and learned a lot from the wealth 
of India from the wealth of our spiritual treaties. Truth is all the same. It comes from the same source. It's interpreted by different prophets at different times. And then administrative confusion joins the truth and creates it and tailors it to their own design. Whereas we are all one flesh. We are responsible to only one creator. And this passage of man needs conscious, conscious study in order to reach your own uh, salvation, both material study and spiritual internalization, not dogmatic. Know thyself, the Bhagavad Gita says. Christ said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Where? Ask inside. Seek where? Seek inside. You are a potential Buddha, a potential Christ, a potential Krishna. You have the seed of divinity. But Jesus said, as you sow, so you reap. If you do not sow, the tree will die. So, I studied the Bible, the Quran, many holy books, the lives of saints, and I saw that everything is saying the same thing. Only man interprets differently. The prophets said the same thing. Because the truth is existential. So I was happy to share this external study of mine that has completed me more in understanding of the self, of my relationship in time on this terra firma. While the spiritual study is another story, but uh, thank you for this time. God bless you all listeners. I hope uh, I was able to throw some joy and mystique and uh, love for that beautiful city, just 35 kilometers from here. Incidentally, Thana is on an island and Bandra and Thane are on the same island. Thana is on the northern point, entry point of Salset. Bandra is on the southern entry point of Salset. And that's why there are two forts built by the Portuguese against invasions to guard the inlets. As you know, Portugal was a naval power. They had no military. And they only controlled 30 kilometers inland from the coast. So from Gujarat to Goa, it's only 30 kilometers wide, their, their, their story. And therefore, they have littered it with forts that oversaw any invasion through the seas. That all changed in time. And thank you very much, Joe, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, I, there are many, many uh, words of praise in the chat box. You can have a look at that later. Uh, but there are also some questions. I'm going to just ask you the questions first. If I can answer them, yes. Sure, sure. Um, Siddesh is asking, who initiated the making of the uh, city of lakes? Thane as the city of lakes. Who initiated? Yeah. I don't understand the question. Um, Sidesh, if you're there, would you he like to... Are talking about the definition of the city of lakes? No, he said he initiated making Thane as the city of lakes. Making Thane the city of lakes. He's got me, girl. Okay, okay. I have to look that up. There's sure. somebody in the crowd that can answer that question. If you can go to him, there's a guy, Makran Joshi. Maybe he'll give you a fabulous uh, piece of history. Okay, uh, would anyone like Please to educate me? Yeah, if anyone wants to answer is, that. Is Makran there? Um, I'm trying to see if he's there. Um... Sorry, Siddesh. These would come up in my later talks, actually. No worries. Let's just move on to the next question. Uh, in the book Mahakavachi Bahuhakar, uh, many regions and villages of Thane are mentioned, like uh, Panchpaka. Pakhandi, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these right. Majiwada. No, it's it's Paj Pakadi and Majiwada. Majiwada, yeah. So uh, ha, she would like to know more about this era. 
this will come in my next talk it's too okay. premature to answer these questions now okay we will wait if there that. is something de dedicated to uh, perhaps what i've spoken about yeah i could opine on a few things yeah let me just uh, check that so this uh, madhukar is asking how old is the kopineshwar linga and what is your view on its size which is as you said what the biggest it's about 4 feet around 4 and, yeah. a, and a few 4 feet and a few inches and how so, old is it it's from the silahara times because uh, uh, the portuguese came and i mean it's all over in all history jason de cunha's books and whatever else hmm. that with the incoming power of the portuguese they destroyed a lot of uh, temples and uh, after the marathas uh, liberated thane they built everything back so hmm. normally you say that it was built in 1739 but mm. it was reconstructed in 1739 and what you see is built in 1739 but that lingam is old okay from those times okay yeah. uh he had another question uh, from venice what was the route to thane was it from the cape of good hope and africa or the Med or from mediterranean further to the red sea portion gulf because there was no suez canal then around africa around africa and well last question from madhukar was was there a fortified wall in the city of thane other than the other than today's fort yes, yes 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 okay there most was a, the, most of the churches there were seven churches and um, uh, various other things within a fort wall okay and we uh, don't see any more right uh, in fact in fact st john's church for example the original st john's church was opposite the town hall Mm-hmm. Now in in a place called Tembi Naka, which is a junction, that was all part of a forted. Okay. Okay. Um, and on then, the coast, on the coast, along the wall was along the coast. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Um, Priyanka has a question. Uh, she firstly she said there should be a permanent exhibition of all these things, and Saint James is. Uh, beautiful church and needs restoration and do you know anyone who is actively restoring this or is there any agency involved in doing that i believe that uh, there are professionals that restore uh, ancient sites and churches and uh, things and they can be contacted i could get an address from uh, the thana church that has just spent a lot of uh, money on doing a grand restoration job with st john the baptist mhm mm Uh, but that is a completely different design of beautiful wooded altars and gilded material whereas st james church is more concrete right. absolute concrete it has no none of that kind of stuff inside needs a uh, restoration in terms of just uh, proper maintenance mm. but there is no one currently as you know doing it well there are i can refer to whoever wants that thing this Okay. I don't have the telephone number on my. Okay. Throw at you just now, but I can okay. get professional contacts and give it to you. Okay. And uh, San wants to know how he can get your book and is it on Amazon? Well, the book will be published. Uh, we have designed twelve chapters out of thirty so far. It will be published. I would believe by the fifteenth of June. Okay. And uh, I am self. Uh, marketing it like i did my bhopal book i printed 500 and i sold 500 in about 3 or 4 months personally then i gave 100 to amazon that went uh, i mean uh, uh, about 50 to amazon that from the 500 that got sold in about a week so uh, this thana book will hopefully also go off my shelf i'm negotiating to Uh, sell to individuals, friends, and also hundred copies to so and so, hundred copies to so and so. So, okay, you know, I'm pre-selling. I mean, I hope that I will have sold five hundred before even the first copy comes out. So That's you, book, so it will possibly be on Amazon and in bookstores. Bookstores, no, no. Okay, Amazon. nothing sells in a bookstore really. These coffee table books, you walk for yeah. years, you'll see the book there. Yeah, they don't sell. No. Okay. I'm faster than the bookstore with my books. Okay. Well, Sam says he's booking a copy already, so you have For one. Sure. <laughs> For sure. 
<laughs> yeah. And I'm sure there'll be many more from this group who will be uh, all also... grace if that happens. Yeah. If they <laughs> Maybe after the second talk, they will book. Uh, there will be lots of more people to you know. Yeah. So that uh, is more yes. detailed on Thane, on the Portuguese, on incidents, on battles, right. on transfer of power, on the why of this and who built that, and you know the nitty gritty. That that's next talk will be that with great photographs. Okay. So, this was generally trying to get you to know the region and the antiquity of the surrounding uh, Absolutely. core till yeah. you come to the DNA heartland, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, so there are huge, many, huge many, yeah, from what we can see, yes, definitely. Uh, yeah. And uh, there are many, many people who have, you know, said it was a wonderful talk and really engrossing and people who live in Thana who didn't know so much about their area. So uh, we, from Khaki, we'd like to thank you once again very much for doing the talk. And we really look forward to part two. So all of you who have logged on today, keep a watch out on our website or however you get our, uh, the information about Khaki. Uh, and uh, please join us again when uh, Joe does his second talk. Yeah, next time, let me tell you that I'll start with a song. I'm a jazz rock ambassador for the country. And basically, I sing all over the world. <laughs> okay. Well, that's enough for people to log on as it is. I didn't go down that street today. But okay. the next talk can begin, begin with a nice uh, original jazz ballad. Absolutely. And I think people will log on just for that alone. So, uh, <laughs> no thank you for this opportunity. I'm, thank you so much. I'm thank you, everyone, so for joining. To get this opportunity to share this. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And we look forward to seeing you next time.